Hi. And so we're starting our first section on evolution. It's chapter 22. And as I mentioned in the beginning, I've taken and divided the chapter up into three um, lectures. And so we're going to start the first one on an introduction to evolution. And to begin with, I like starting with um, a picture here. This is showing um, a variety of insects, most of nearly all of which are in the Coleoptera beetles. And if you look at it, you can see this huge diversity in the shapes and colors and sizes that they have. And if you think about it, you want to wonder as a biologist, how did that come to be? How do we have so many different types of these beetles? And of course, we think about it as biologists being explained by the theory of evolution. And the main, but not only, um, factor in evolution that we'll be talking about will be natural selection. And today I'm going to focus just on natural selection. We'll come back later on the semester and take up some more aspects of evolution. And so we're in chapter 22. And um, I first want to talk about some stuff that's not in chapter 22. Um, you get it more in Bio 130 or an intro biology course. And that is the scientific method, because we're going to be talking about different experiments, for examples. And so I want to review a little bit about the scientific method. Um, I want to go over what a theory is, because we call it the theory of evolution. What does that term mean? And we use it a little bit different in biology than you do um, out in just regular conversation. All right. And then I'm going to give you, I'm going to start by giving you an evolutionary experiment. And uh, it's a very simple one. And I've posted a link in Canvas to this experiment that I'm talking about so you can read it more. And not to the journal article, it's actually an interesting one um, that actually um, a uh, magazine, The Atlantic, um, talked about and interviewed the researchers. So you actually can get a little bit of feel of what it's like to be a grad student and the trials and tribulations of doing field work. Um, but anyway, so I'll talk about that experiment. Then after that, we'll take some time and actually summarize the steps of natural selection and see how it works. So that's my game plan for this little segment of um, the lecture. So first thing we want to go over is what is the scientific method? And so um, when you think about steps in the scientific method, and I'd say, I'd ask, well, do you use the scientific method? Who uses the scientific method? Is it only for um, researchers? And of course, the answer is no. It's just the basic process of figuring out using the critical thinking skills and basing things on observations and tests. And so um, in the scientific method, we start with the first thing is an observation. You see something that makes you wonder about it. And so last week, I had you post a picture of a biological organism that's something you had some familiarity with and a question that you had. And then we all shared and, 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 and posted to other people um, on those problems, right? Or those observations that you saw. And so that's kind of how I'll give you an idea of how things start, all right? So you have some kind of observation or problem, right? Then with that, you have to have some information on that system is what we call it. And if you didn't, you go and you'd research that to figure out more about it so that you could make some kind of um, guess. And this guess is what we call an hypothesis. And you've heard of it as an educated guess. And that doesn't mean you have to have a master's or PhD in science to do science. Simply means the education is that you know enough about the system, right, about that organism, that you can make a guess, right? And you're basing it on prior work, all right? And then once you have an hypothesis, in science we set up a way to test it, right? And so the way we're going to test it is something called an experiment. And then in the experiment, you're going to collect data. And with that data, you're going to analyze what you thought was going to happen versus what you actually got into the experiment. And from that, right, you can either support your hypothesis or you have to go back and make a new hypothesis. And then the last step is important in that if you, it is hypothesis is supported and you made some conclusions, you actually publish it in a paper. And that's not so you become famous. It's, it's so that you put it out there for other people to critique it, right? And so they may interpret the data differently. And also that's the basis that science builds on. And that's how you got the education so that you can make your hypothesis. Now other people can add what you've done to the big um, um, ball of work that is science. And they can make their own hypothesis and it moves on, right? And um, in that third, I've taken the chapter and divided it into three sections. Today we're going over um, natural selection, right? The next one we'll be going over um, uh, evidence for evolution, why, what supports this idea that we have. 
And then the last part I've taken from the chapter and expanded on a little bit is this little thing about publishing a paper, right? And it's how Darwin actually used the work of so many other people to combine into making what is now the theory of evolution. And so we'll come back to that when we get to it. So here's an example, right? Your TV remote doesn't work, all right? And so the question is, what's wrong, all right? And so from the level of your understanding of the system, there could be something wrong in the circuitry or other things, right? But the simplest thing from our level of understanding with our education, the type of hypothesis that I could make on that is that the batteries aren't working, all right? So my prediction is if I put in new batteries, it will work. I switch the batteries, it works, it supports that idea, that hypothesis that the batteries are broken. If I switch the batteries and they don't work, that rejects my hypothesis. But unfortunately, with my education and my understanding of the circuitry, that's all I could do, right? Someone else could actually go in and look at the circuit board or something like that and make another hypothesis, all right? So in a nutshell, very quick, that's the scientific method, right? A couple things about the scientific method. First of all, what kind of questions can we answer in science, right? So for example, do you have a soul, right? Very important question, but not one I can help you with, with science. And because in science, what we're limited to are things we can measure. We have to be able to um, have a way of measuring things, right? And so that's why every time we have a new way of measuring things, right, science advances. Right, and so um, when we can start using x rays to see inside structures, science advanced. When we use radioisotopes to actually follow the intermediate steps along a biological pathway in enzyme kinetics, that advanced science. Right now, satellite imagery allows us to do a lot of ecology from space and, and record data that we never could have imagined um, before when we're just limited to being on land. Right, so all these things show how um, science can advance every time we have new ways of measuring things. Right. And so I'm um, looking at this is a nice diagram and it shows you um, how the experimental method works. And so you have your um, some aspect of nature, your observation, or could be a problem. Unfortunately, a lot of time in ecology, it's problems. There's been an oil spill. All right. And so you want to know how to clean it up. And then you're trying to figure out later how well things have come back. Right. Um, so it could be a problem or when you go see a doctor. Right. And so you can see a doctor and you're visiting her and, and you're going there with some symptoms, you have a problem. And then she, with her background, right, can make an educated guess, right, give you some kind of course of treatment. And then you come back and evaluate um, the hypothesis. Did it work or not? So actually, every time you visit a doctor, it's a bit of an experiment itself, right? That one probably wouldn't lead directly to uh, result, uh, published results, but it adds to the overall, if you, uh, the doctor's experience, I've seen multiple patients and observing things can combine things to actually make a bigger study out of that, all right? Okay, so that's in a nutshell. That was very quick. Um, um, we will study it in uh, great detail um, if, you take, if you've already had 130 or when you do take bio 130 or 102. But we need a little bit of background because I will be referring to experiments and we'll be doing a couple of little experiments in labs during, during the semester. Okay, second thing I wanna go over is a term, a little bit of just English, right? And so you may hear from some people or some people say evolution, oh, it's just a theory. And so my question is, what is a theory? And we have three terms that we use in of science. Well, four if you put in hypothesis that I just gave you, right? And so if you remember, hypothesis is an educated guess. And so we have theory, we have law, and we have dogma. And so the three are a little bit different. And so um, if you, um, if I were to ask you about it, and so um, for, uh, for gravity, right, we have the law of gravity. Why is it the law of gravity, but it's not the law of evolution? So if I took my pen and I dropped it, it falls, all right? Now, if you had physics and I asked you in class, right, people would say, well, how fast did it fall? Well, it falls. 9.8 meters per second squared. Good. All right? Million years from now, I don't know what's happened to the Earth or what's happened, or you know, if it hasn't changed in the size and components, right? And our descendants, I don't know what that might look at like by then, right? Um, took something of this mass and they dropped it, it would do the same thing. Fall to the center of Earth, 9.8 meters per second squared. Why? 
right? There is no why. It just does it because it's the law, right? So laws definitely are repeatable, right? They've been tested, right? But there's no explanation with them, right? For evolution, it has also been tested, right? But it isn't the type of case where you can make a prediction. Evolution or theories are more of an explanation. So like I said, I can't, I can't say what humans might look like a million years from now, but I could account for the process that would explain any of those changes that might come about. And that would be natural selection and evolution, right? And then lastly, we have dogma. And dogma is based on beliefs, right? So it's not something that's generally tested, right? And so it would be something a little bit out. So in science, we're typically using theory and um, law. Okay, and so, um, and we also have, of course, hypothesis, right? So dogma is not tested. It's a belief-based system, typically. Um, Science is limited to things that we can measure. The hypothesis is the educated guess. Remember, education doesn't mean you have a degree. It means you know enough about the system that you can make a hypothesis. Like in the remote, I can make a hypothesis about the batteries not working. But once that hypothesis rejected, I don't know enough about the circuitry to make the next hypothesis. Right. Okay, and then our three terms, theory, there are two terms and law. And remember, theories are comprehensive explanations, right? You can extrapolate, but they're not predictive. They usually don't get summarized into a formula, right? Laws describe physical phenomena. They're limited to the set of, exp of um, conditions, and they can't be taken outside of the conditions. They're not bigger. They're not a comprehensive explanation, right? And important, both of these are rigorously tested, evaluated, and accepted, right? So we do not need any more information, right, for uh, the, the theory of evolution to become a law of evolution. It won't become a law of evolution because it's an explanation, right? And so, for example, they're looking for a comprehensive theory in physics, right, to join together gravity and all sorts of other things, right? And that would be a comprehensive explanation. Okay, so let's relate this to evolution. So here's kind of a little tweak on that diagram I showed you. So we have observations. So these are more evolution biological um, observations. So first we have observations that individuals in a population vary in their heritable characteristics. So hopefully all those terms make sense. Heritable, right, in this case means that it's genetic. You're passing it on from one generation to the next. And they're varying, meaning that one individual is different from the next, just like you and your closely related brother, sister, siblings, cousins, right? Share some genes, but have your own differences, right? The other thing you have on the side there is that organisms produce more offspring than the environment can support. So not all of the offspring will survive. And that means that some individuals are well suited, better suited to the environment, would tend to have more offspring survive than others. And this over time, the selection pressure, would actually accumulate a change in um, genes in their frequencies in the population over time. Okay, so this is the experiment I want to talk about. And again, I posted the link on Canvas. You can read more about this. And so in Nebraska, a grad student, that's his name down there, Rowan Barrett, right, has six study sites. You can see four of them here. Um, he had a long, hard time finding the study sites. These are in an uh, uh, alfalfa field. And what he was testing are uh, mice. And so what he wanted to do to test the mice is he wanted to see what would happen over time. And if you notice in the background, um, it's a very sandy. This is called the um, sand hills. It's very sandy in this area. But there's also some areas that have a lot of um, organic material in the soil that are darker soil, or loamy soil. And that's what's happening with this farmer's fields. So some plots here, he has six. We've seen four of the six sites that he has have a very sandy soil. And other ones have this loam or darker soil. All right. And then what he did is you can see he put up this um, uh, fence. And then in the fence, he put up a two foot high metal barrier going all the way around. And that prevents the mice from escaping and actually had to bury it into the ground. And there's lots in the article of all the problems he had with this in the field experiment, trying to get this set up with the snow and everything. But lots of things were going up, right? 
But anyway, so after a while, he got his, his design to work. He could keep the mice contained in these six plots. But then what he wanted to do is see what would happen over time in the response to the soil. And the one thing he did is that he removed all the rattlesnakes from the plot. So there's some other students helping him out. Right? And so they removed the rattlesnakes and put them over the fence and just released them wild, but took them out of the six plots. But he left them open to hawks coming in from above. All right. And then he followed the morphs of the different types. There's a lighter morph and a darker morph right, of the mice. And this is just showing up the morphs, but actually showing him how he had to bury the sand and how they're running around in the field. And so what he did... is he collected all, removed the rattlesnakes, collected all the mice and removed them, then went up to the hills and uh, collected mice for a uniform population that are all in the same kind of soil up in the hills. And so he started with those mice and brought them in and put a certain number in each one of the six test plots. And then over time, over a couple seasons, he came back and analyzed and what he noticed was that the darker morphs become more common on top of the darker soils and the lighter morphs were more common on sandy soils. Morph, like morphology, means any shape or structure. So a morph would be anything you can recognize in a population like red um, roses versus white or orange or yellow roses, right? So each one of those would be a morph, right? Of the same species, right? So these are the same species, just slightly different coloration patterns, right? And what he actually did, he actually looked and he knew um, what gene was responsible for this change in the um, fur color, right? And basically, they have different um, genes that deposit the pigments into the hair. And if you have a mutation on this one um, allele, it will prevent the dark pigment from being put into the hair and basically makes the mice more blonde color, very light color, right? And it's, pop, and it's common in the population, and so what you'd be seeing is by the success rate of who has that morph or doesn't have that morph would change the population to be lighter or darker. Okay, so I have some questions, right? So I want you to think about this. First of all, why did they remove the local mice at the beginning and start of the experiment? Why do they remove the rattlesnakes but leave the hawks? This one you might need to know a little bit about biology already. If not, I'll help you out with that. Just think about that for a minute. Think about how they feed. Very different. How did the population change? Were there any new traits? Were there any unique types of individuals we didn't see before? And then is this evolution? So if we want to think about that, first of all, why remove the local mice at the start and use one from the surrounding hills, right? And so there it's kind of a control. You, so you don't know if this darker soil, they may already have a population that's adapted to it, right? And so to make it uniform, he took a larger population from a uniform habitat up in the hills right and then moved them on to to start the experiment to see how that population changed right so if he didn't remove the local mice he wouldn't be starting with a homogeneous mix right so you want to start so all six plots have the same mix of genes basically he's taking a population up in the hill and dividing it into six plots and see how they change over time so that was important right second rattlesnakes and so rattlesnakes are pit vipers and so they hunt and they have little gland, uh, little organs, um, called pit organs on, on them, on the front end of the head and tongue. And they use that to sense heat. And so they're not really going after mice by the color of the fur, but more by the heat source, right? So removing that, um, the rattlesnakes left it so that the predation by the hawks would be a stronger pressure, right? And so he was tweaking it a little bit there, but that's also to speed it up, right? Because he only had a couple seasons. So he wants to see the maximum selection pressure he could um, in, in an otherwise kind of natural setting, right? How do the populations change, right? And so, again, it's the population that was changing, not individuals, right? But if you look at the average or the number of the individuals that with, the, with the darker morph or the lighter morph of the gene, it did change over the time of the experiment. All right. And 
we think of evolution, you know, in the big game often as, you know, um, of, uh, the, uh, the dinosaurs dying out, but before they did, some of them got wings and became birds, right? So you have these dinosaurs turning into birds, right? So are basically descendants of dinosaurs. They have these massive changes over time. But what about this, right? Um, no new traits, right? No unique individuals. They're either the lighter or the darker morphs, which were there before. But this is still evolution. And this is the evolution that we'll call microevolution, small change. And these are the types of things we can observe in our lifetimes and make experiments on because otherwise it takes too long and we don't live long enough. So we can refer and we have evidence for these big macroevolutionary changes, right? Um, but this is still evolution, right? So this is a nice experiment. And again, I have the link so you can read more about it in detail. I went a little quick here. But it's a nice example of the actually see and you can actually test and even relate it down to the genetics, right? And you can see a lot of factors here. You have variation in a population. You have selection pressure. And in this case, how well you're camouflaged with the background versus the hawks coming to eat them, right, is a strong selection pressure. And it's changing the most common forms in the population over time, right? Because the, if you're the wrong color from the background, you stand out what we call biology more apparent to the predator and if you're more apparent to the predator you get eaten all right and so you're not going to leave as many offspring okay so um this is kind of a nice little beginning and introduction to um evolution and so i'm going to take evolution and again i'm assuming you're reading the chapter in the chapter they go into a lot more detail Right. And so they give you lots more examples. And so the book is really good and rich in that. So um, do take time to read the textbook. I'm going to take the natural selection and break it down first into three general phases. Then we're going to come back and talk about each one of those in more detail. Right. So the first is the four general phases. So there's three phases. Right. First thing about evolution is populations. Right. And so evolution works on the population level. And the population has variety in it, right? And so if you look um, around, if we were in the classroom or any of your classes, or just going down the streets, we're all human, right? So look at all the other people, right? And so 99, whatever, we, we have a huge amount of the exact same genes, right? But then there's slight differences, right? And these slight differences are what allow you to recognize one individual, your friend from another, an unknown person, right? but they still have two eyes, nose, mouth, right? So we have the same species, but in any population, there's a variety of traits, there's variation. And then over time, so time is really important in evolution. You need time for it to work, right? There's either a competition or selection or some kind of differential survival, right? And so, um, and we'll come back and talk more about these in more detail when we get to microevolution and macroevolution. But anyway, because of this, whatever the factors are accounting for it, not all the individuals will reproduce at the same rate. So just think of your extended family members or friends or other people you know. Probably some have children, some don't have children, some have more children than others, right? And there's all sorts of factors that are involved in that, all right? Same thing's happening out in nature, all right? So um, if it's a very, a tree that's in a, a very wet area and, not, and it's too waterlogged and can't really grow well, it's not going to produce as many flowers and seeds as one that's in a loamy soil with good drainage in the winter and produces an abundance of a crop, all right? So things like that. So there are different factors, right? And so over time, this will change the frequency of those genes in the population. And so if you're the red flowering plant and you're better at attracting the local pollinator, right? The bees are gonna be more attracted to, uh, hummingbirds in this case for red, will be more attracted to the red flowers, right? And so if you're a redder flower, you're gonna get pollinated more, you're gonna produce more seeds than one that's got a yellow flower, right? And so over time, you'd expect in a local area, the red flowers to become more abundant and the yellow flowers to become slightly less abundant. Nice example of that is if you go to the coast versus inland, you'll notice that just about a lot of the flowers along the coast that have, are like our poppies, you think of the golden poppies, you go to the coast, they're yellow, right? If you look at our lupins inland, they're kind of 
Um, there are some yellow ones, but they're mostly blue and purple on the coast. They're yellow, right? And it has to do with the bee pollinators on the coast, strongly selecting for yellow flowers. So even on a species closer to the coast and the shoreline versus inland, right, you can see this variation taking place. Okay, so those are three main factors you want to think about. Populations have variety in them, and it's working on the population level, right? You do not evolve as an individual, right? So in science, right? Outside, you will use the term evolve simply means change, right? So your work product can evolve, right? You're, you're writing an essay and it's evolving, like your, your, your oral report, right? And beginning for that you can present at the end of the semester, at the beginning, it's you have all these ideas, but it's going to change and evolve and morph until what's the final product, right? But in science, when we're using biology to term evolve, we're talking about population level. Your genes aren't changing during your lifetime. And what evolution is, the change in the number of gene frequencies in a population. So it's the population level, right? Then there's differential survival. That's that second part. So that either by competition, natural selection, whatever is causing this difference in survival, right? Not, so you have a variety in the population. It's genetic. You have only some are reproducing more right, or not at all versus others, and then that's going to change the gene frequencies over time looking at generations, right, so those are three main features, right. Okay, so let's take the first one and look at it in a little bit more detail, populations, right, and so populations have variety in traits, genetically we call phenotypes among the individuals, and what's important about this, this variation comes about um, primarily by sexual reproduction and recombination, all right? So um, think about it. So if you have brothers and sisters, or you know someone has brothers and sisters, right? Even with the same parents, right? The brothers and the sisters aren't identical. Why is that? They have the same parents, right? Reproducing, yet their offspring are different, right? If you have a large family, or you know a large family, you have lots of different variations there. And that's not by mutation, all right? And so we'll get to some types of cell division later on. But basically, when people go to make the gametes, the sperm and the egg, they're passing on only half the genes, and it's kind of mixing it up every time they do that, right? They're not the same. So in your lifetime, you're not making the same sperm and egg, right? And so every time a human goes to reproduce, right, um, what eggs is, is involved and what sperm is involved, even from the same individuals, is going to be slightly different, right? That is not mutation. We call that recombination. You're recombining the genes that are already there. And that's the bulk, the vast majority of um, what's tweaking from one, pop one generation to the next, um, the gene frequencies and the, this diversity, right? Second part in the population is mutations do happen. They're rare, right? And most mutations are harmful, so they actually don't. But occasionally, over the long term, a mutation can give a new trait, right? And that's where new traits come from, all right? And when we get to lineages, we'll talk lots about that and maybe more than you want to, but we'll follow through and see how step by step, right, slight little variations build up over time. It's not like all of a sudden a dinosaur sprouted wings in one mutation. It doesn't happen that way, right? It's much more complex and a slower pace, right? And so key things is recombination is mixing up genes that are already there, right? Any new traits come about by mutation, right? And they triple in over a long term. Both of these things are referring to genetics. And so these traits are what we call heritable right? They're being passed on. They're genetic. Okay, here's an example of just shells, right? And so this could just be a random pattern of shells and the coloration of the shells that come about. And if it were linked to predation and protection from predators, right, that could be significant, right? But anyway, it's just showing you some genetic variation in a population, right? More shells over here. This is snails. Showing you a variation, different shell types. Here, these are lady beetles, right? And you can see that. And so you recognize them all as lady beetles, but obviously they're not all exactly the same, right? And so there is some variety or variation in there, right? And so that's that genetic. 
Okay, when we look at this variation, the trait, that variation we see must be heritable, right? And so um, what I'm compact or contrasting that is with a physiological response, right? And so one animal might be really big, but that happens to be because they just happen to be in an area with abundant food source, but genetically they're not that big where one may be smaller just because of the amount of food it got. Right, and so you might think that smaller one passes on the genes, but if it moves to air with more abundant food, they get larger. All right, and so the trait that we're looking on is you want to contrast the physiological response versus heritabilities, the genetic traits that are being passed on from time to time. All right, and the other thing is it needs to impact fitness. So the traits we're looking at are ones that are actually impacting whether the species, the individuals, are reproducing more or less, or surviving longer to reproduce more or less. All right. And so you can have ones that actually are variety, but actually don't really account one way or the other. And we call those neutral mutations, right? So for example, your blood type, whether you're type A or B or O, overall generally doesn't have a whole lot to do with the number of children you're probably gonna uh, have. I know very few people that choose their partner based on their blood type, right? And so that, in a lot of senses, I mean, there's some diseases that may link to a little bit, but by and large, the blood type is a neutral mutation, right? It is passed on, but it doesn't seem to be influencing anyone's fitness overall. Okay, the selection part, right? And so just think of what the term selection means, right? You're selecting some individuals, and the one that's selecting here is nature. Right. Um, when we get to examples in my next little mini lecture, it's not the next two aren't going to be quite as long as this one. All right. Um, we'll talk about artificial selection and how plant breeders um, actually choose different types of um, morphs and select those ones to get a new type of thing. Right. And so that would be artificial because um, someone human is doing the selecting here. It's nature. And so what happens is there's struggle or competition to survive among the offspring. Right. And one thing to remember is that over time, the conditions will change, right? It, it, from one year to the next, just think of uh, around here, a couple of years it's wet, a couple of years drought, conditions are constantly changed, new predators move in, all sorts of things that happen, right? And so that's always going to cause some kind of competition or struggle um, or a new disease comes in, right, or challenge. And Darwin focused a lot um, early on on just the resources and so a population even if conditions are good right at some point the population will get so large they're actually beginning to exceed right the amount of resources available to that population right and to that population and so that would by itself cause a competition within and among um, the individuals right for um, resources to survive right and so the size of the population itself can cause this selection pressure. Okay, so conditions change, right? Populations will have a greater fertility, meaning they can make more offspring. Resources at some point are limited, all right? And so the population's own growth, right, can exceed the resources. And over this time, maybe a novel trait or variety is, is taken in, or maybe just one morph is more active than a more successful than another morph, or a new predator comes in. So what was possibly the most favorable? So in this example of the mini experiment I gave you, we're looking at predation from above, the hawk looking down on the mice in the field, and so the, how well camouflaged you are, right? But let's say the rattlesnakes turn out to be a, a stronger predator, and then maybe how much heat you give off will be a different selection pressure, right? And so that might change um, what's happening in the population, right? And of course, climate changes. It has been forever. Right now, anthropogenic or seems to be speeding up a natural process, right? But it has never been constant, right? And so all these things are challenging to populations. And so you get this competition to survive. And the survivors that reproduce are called what we say, Darwin used the term, better fit, right? And it has a lot of problems um, 
because fit and people think fitness so they're always thinking that means the bigger better stronger right and it doesn't mean that right you can be the biggest most robust strongest one and have the best mating call and everything is going fine but if your immune system doesn't work you still die off and leave no offspring right so actually evolution is usually selecting you have to be good enough you have to be good enough at everything to survive and pass on those traits and if there's one extra little thing that makes you be a little bit better than your neighbor right so often it's not that one is massively more successful it's that this nest of birds with this particular song is producing successful reproduction twice a year right and this other nest of birds with it's not in not doing the right mating song only can mate once every other year right but it's still robust finds food and everything that difference in mating song is going to be the selection pressure right so it doesn't mean bigger better stronger you got to be good enough right Fitness simply means whatever trait you have allows you to have more offspring, more fertile offspring that passes on their genes. That's all fitness is. Okay, better fit. So the fitness is the ability to have more offspring, the uh, higher frequency of genes in the um, gene pool, right? And Darwin noted that most populations could grow exponentially. He did some armchair calculations, and he said that if all the elephants that were ever born survived, and all their baby elephants that were ever born survived, and all the grandbaby elephants that were ever born survived, he estimated that within a thousand years, the entire earth would be covered in elephants. But obviously, it's not, all right? There are limitations, right? So not all offspring survive and reproduce. over time right and so the other thing is time is important and what was very important for darwin was coming up with the theory is by then people would begin geologists begin to figure out that the earth is in fact very old billions of years old and that would allow time for this to work right and so it's a slow process accumulating things over very long periods of time Okay, here is a single puffball. It's a type of mushroom that we'll be getting to um, when we get to mushrooms or fungi in the labs, right? And you can actually see, and this is a round hollow structure, and the rain will actually come and just makes like a little bump, 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 and it actually puffs the spores out. And what you're seeing here, right, those are big chunks. These little, this is the dust here you can even see. Those are the spores. This organism can um, reproduce trillions of little spores going off, right? So a huge reproductive rate. Okay, so again, we use the term struggle, but it doesn't have to be a fight. It simply can be simple as a seed germinating earlier and getting established first and produces 120 seeds in a season. And a later germinating plant only makes 50 seeds, right? Right now with climate change, right? This is a significant factor because when I was younger, you would never plant anything before March, your annuals outside March 15th, because that was the last date given for the last frost of the year right now it's more like march 1st right and so plants that have adapted to start sprouting earlier actually now have advantage they can start going i'm um, getting the roots down and get larger and so this would actually um one mechanism so how plants could adapt to the changing environment right which would be important as time goes on and again fitness is simply the success rate so here right the plant doesn't have to be bigger, better. It just simply has to have its seeds germinate a couple weeks earlier, and that will be its fitness, right? Give it a better fitness, right? Because they're succeeding more over time. Okay. A couple of key things. It's the population, not individuals. You in biology, you don't evolve, right? But the population in California can evolve. And we look at the demographics of how the population is changing from one generation to the next, from one decade to the next, right? Periods of stress is when fewer individuals are surviving, and that means they're passing on fewer genes. And if you're in that pool passing on the genes, it has a bigger impact um, on the population. So basically, when things are when the going's good, just about everyone's reproducing, there's not a lot of evolutionary selection. When things aren't going so well, that's a lot of stress on the population. That's when we see things change much faster. 
right? And we get bigger changes in a shorter amount of time. Natural selection weeds things out, right? It's not making anything new, right? That comes from mutations, right? And so if we just had natural selection over time, right, it would just continue to select one trait and you'd actually lose genetic diversity. And so the way genetic diversity is, is retained, right, is by mutations slightly inserting new genes. Or natural selection is moving in one way, but before it can weed out everything in the population down to just a few individuals, it goes back another way, right? And that allows the other ones to start reproducing, right? Maintaining a, a, a gene bank within there. Again, thinking about the environment, right? As climate changes, other factors happen, they cause changes. Those are selection pressures on what we in biology call a selection pressure, who's gonna survive and who's not. Okay, next lecture, we're gonna go over um, more examples. I'll give you a few right now. There's also, at this time, will be a good time after I'm through with this lecture is to look at the evolution simulation, right? So I have two things posted there. You have the um, example of microevolution um, experiment in Nebraska that I started the lecture with. There is a nice simulation. It's a little bit long in the beginning for the explanation, to, so you fully, but it's really well done. You have three factors looking at, and actually, um, she, she, you can see how over time the population is changing and the reproductive rates, right? Um, here's a nice little diagram, pretty straightforward. And so you start with a, a population that has a variety of different organisms. This is similar to an experiment that I showed you, and there's a bird, and so obviously being more what we call apparent to the predator makes it easier for the bird. So the bird's coming by quick. It's going to eat the bug that it sees. These look like little beetles there. Um, it's going to eat the beetle that it sees the most easily to catch, right? And the ones that's an over time, kind of what happened to the mice in the field, the ones that aren't as apparent are more camouflaged, right? And so that would be an example of evolution, right? Following over time, these three plants are all orchids, which means they have the same common ancestor. And so from an ancestor over time, building up mutations and the selecting for those in different populations and spreading out, and we'll talk about how you get different species and lineages when we get to that later on. But anyway, this is just showing you the effect of evolution. You can see these three petals in the back and this kind of slipper in the front right? That's all inherited. That's what makes them an orchid, right? So they're still passing on orchid genes, but different ones have been selected. And this is being a flower. So the most obvious thing it would be is it's co-evolving with its different pollinators, right? And so here how the flowers have adapted and which ones attract the pollinator more, right? Slight changes over time build up and you end up with these very distinct morphologies. And you want to stress, I want to stress the difference between physiology and the genetics. And so this man is, is preparing a bonsai. And so this would be in nature, if these seeds fell off, right, and they grew in the ground, would they turn into a large pine tree or they grow to be a small little pine tree? What do you think? Well, the reason that pine tree is small is because it has a very small amount of soil. Right, and we'll get into the actual plant hormones that are accounting for this. You have the growth hormones coming up, the cytokinins versus the auxins, the inhibitor hormones coming down from the top. Right, but that's later on. Right, but basically, what's happening here is this tree is being dwarfed because its roots can't grow very much. Right, but the seeds genetics hasn't been changed. Right, and so if the seeds were planted in deep soil and could grow normally, it would have very large branches and leaves and, and or needles, right? Needle size would be the same, but it'd be a much larger tree, right? And so it's the genetics. Darwin, and I'm going to um, show you a quote here from Darwin in The Origin of Species, says, there's a grandeur in this view of life, that being evolution, with its several powers have been having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one, and that, whilst the plant has gone on cycling and according to the fixed law of gravity, forms from so simple beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. A couple of things looking in there. One, he talks about few forms or one. Plant has gone on cycling, all right? And then endless forms. 
And if you look, all of these things are in this little diagram. And so they just um, restored his house um, outside of London. And in it, they actually opened up his library. And so one of it is his books is this diagram. So we're kind of famous now in biology circles. And it simply says up here, I think. And you look down here, this little number one. So he had the idea way back then that all life might come from one universal common ancestor. The cycling of the earth, that's that long time. Evolution takes millions, hundreds of millions, billions of years to account for it. And then all these little branches will be that endless forms. Right? So all of that's from that idea. It's kind of summarized neat in this little diagram that he has. So what does it look like? And we'll get to, um, I'll show you some pictures, but we're going to start the next, the two, um, the second half of the chapter, I'm make into two mini lectures and talk more about evidence. But here's just, just without getting into a lot of the details, what we would see a descent with modification means. And so that's how we decide, we, we phrase um, evolution. So you can see these lines going off from the left to the right, though, and see the time down here. So that's up to today. Today we have three species of elephant left. Notice these other lines don't make it all the way. They die out. So those are the descendants. But if you look how they change, that's modification. So the descendant populations show modifications over the ones that were before. All right. And so here, as I mentioned before, the elephant just didn't pop up. You can see all the different forms and the slow changes over time to get what will be elephants. And if you go back far enough, you get to a common ancestor to the, and everything along here we call the tree. And each of these branches we call a clade. So those are terms that you'll be, um, I'll be using and get used to me using during the semester. So this would be a phylogenetic tree, right? And those are branches. Any branch points are the clades. And so you can actually see that the elephants are actually related to manatees, right? If you go back far enough. Here's one on a bigger scale. So, of course, the elephants, this is all one clade, one order within the mammals. This is vertebrates going farther back where just mammals, right, are just a, would be a clade on here. And so if you look at branch points, each one of these clades will come off. And they can see features that give a, a new things that have come about, the descent with modification. And showing you how well vertebrates relate to each other. And if we look in the fossil record, and this is a nice example that your textbook goes into um, looking at these um, uh, extinct um, arthropods or shellfish. And you can see there's a trend over time of this big space around the head and the front end of the exoskeleton getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Right. And so you can actually see this along the fossil record. So that gives us a little bit of evidence. Okay, um, this is it for this lecture. The next one I'm going to take on um, the second half of chapter 22. I'm taking up to two little mini lectures and focusing one just evidence. Why do we think um, evolution is a theory? Is there enough evidence to support that? And then the last mini lecture will be on the people that influenced Darwin um, in coming up with his idea and writing his book um, as an example of how science works. You build on what other people have done. Okay. Um, following this lecture right now, I would recommend you do is following in the sequence in the module is do the evolution um, simulation, the online simulation. And then after that, I would look at the other two um, lectures. Okay, any questions, be sure to email me or check in um, on Zoom in my um, office hours.